lastly, we have a very interesting uh, report uh, to talk about, a report that we worked on for uh, the last uh, almost two years since uh, the AR6 report started to be published in August uh, 21 with the Working Group 1 uh, report. And um, so what I'm going to do today, tonight, is uh, to give uh, a, a general uh, overview of our report. We uh, published uh, 13 chapters, and I can't even talk about all the chapters that would be far too uh, too long so i selected a few chapters and i give some general uh, information about it and of course everybody then should uh, should read the full uh, report for all the the details um because there are hundreds of details uh, in the, in the report it's 100 pages 180 uh, pages sorry and um and um, the good news by the way is that um Soon, uh, the report will also be available as an ebook and as a paperback uh, version. And uh, Andy May, my um, co-author, arranged all this, and I'm very grateful that he did. Uh, he did that. So uh, you already explained that uh, I started Quintel with uh, Guus Berghout in 2019, and um, internationally, Guus uh, did most of the work, and um, it focused on the World Climate Declaration that most of you probably uh, in the audience uh, uh, signed. And uh, I was more doing the work in the Netherlands and Guus was leading the international uh, clientele network. But when this uh, new IPCC report came out uh, and with my experience with past IPCC reports, because I wrote a book in Dutch, The State of the Climate in 2010, and that was dealing with the third and the fourth IPCC report. and. As you told, in um, 2014, I published a very extensive report together with Nick Lewis for the Global Warming Policy Foundation about climate sensitivity. So um, these are the two. Um, so the, the AR6 report um, consists of, of in total uh, seven reports because there are also a few special reports like the SR. Um, special report 1.5 degrees is also part of the AR6 cycle. But we concentrated on the working group one on the left and the working group uh, two report, which is more about impacts. And so what is the IPCC about? Um, the IPCC claims itself that their reports are comprehensive and balanced. So in a sense, uh, in a sense, what we what we did is we investigated if this is true. Are they really comprehensive and are they balanced? Uh, these are the persons who uh, who helped us uh, uh, doing the work, and um, so several, uh, all of them contributed to one or more chapters. And I specifically want to highlight Andy May because I think he he worked so much. He did so much work for the report, and uh, also now for um, publishing the book. That um, yeah, I really want to thank him for uh, for all the for all his efforts. So this is the result, the frozen climate views of the IPCC. And um, we are now going to give some, uh, some examples. Um, this is our press release that you can find on the clintel.org uh, website. And the conclusion, we, we discussed a lot because first we had, as, a com as, the, as the headline of the press release, we first simply had the frozen climate views of the IPCC, but then I was discussing this with people in my uh, in my in my group, and I was explaining what it was about, and then I I, I said several times, okay, well, they, the IPCC made a lot of errors, and when I said that, I, okay, this should be the headline of the press release. So then we came up with this um, with this press release, and it was funny. We tried to just distribute it um, through our national. Uh, press agency. So in, in, in France, you have AFP, in, 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 in the US, you have AP, and in Holland, we have ANP. And so I contacted AMP and I wanted them to distribute our press release uh, by paying them. And they refused. And they refused because, yeah, they said, well, we, um, we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot decide if this is correct. And uh, so they didn't they didn't dare to burn their fingers on it. Uh, that's my uh, my conclusion. So today, um, well, here you see Mike's nature trick to hide a decline. Uh, I, I suppose that uh, many of you know where this is coming from. This is coming from the climate gate emails. This was one of the most notorious um, uh, phrases from the from the climate gate emails. 
And here in a cartoon by Josh, it is explained what it was. It was that one of the proxy reconstructions, the, the blue one, went down after 1960. And then they simply cut off, cut it off in 1960 and they extended it with the measured uh, thermometer uh, measurements. And so this was hiding the decline. And they called this their nature trick. So what I will do to today is show you some of the tricks that the IPCC is still using, according to us, in, uh, in their current uh, report. So trick number one is, um, well, during COVID, uh, I actually, I read for the first time, I read the book 1984 by George Orwell, because I was thinking that uh, in this COVID period, we were really like entering some sort of 1984 um, um, society. And of course, those of you who read uh, 1984, they know you know that there is uh, this ministry of truth. And what they do is that everything that is opposed to the, 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 the big leader, that they will simply rewrite uh, history. And uh, our uh, conclusion in the first two chapters, the first two chapters, they deal with uh, paleo uh, climatology. And our conclusion is that the IPCC indeed is erasing history or is rewriting uh, history. Um, and so in uh, 1984, you have this slogan at the Ministry of Truth, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And I would like to add a new one for the IPCC. And that is warm is cold. What do, do I mean by that? Well, in the literature, and many of you, uh, many of you will be aware of that, uh, there is this period uh, about 10,000 to five, 6,000 years ago, and it's called the Holocene Climate Optimum or the Holocene Thermal Maximum. And this period is known to be quite warm. But of course, the question is, how warm was it? And according to the IPCC, it was not as warm as it is today because as you know, the, IP, the IPCC came up with a new hockey stick uh, reconstruction, about which I will talk in a second. But at the left of this side, you see the gray bar. And David, explain me how I can. So the, the gray bar here. And it's written there that this is the warmest multi-century period in more than 100,000 years. So... What they are claiming with this graph is not only that it's now, the warming now is unprecedented in the last 2000 years, but also that it's now warmer than in the last 100,000 or even 120,000 years. So they actually claim that it is now warmer than during the Holocene climate optimum. Well, Javier Binos um, wrote the chapter about the Holocene and he has, um, oh yeah, here is the claim by the IPCC. So global surface temperatures are more likely than not unprecedented in the past 125 years. And um, so this, this graph is from uh, Javier in the, in the chapter one of our report. And here is the original uh, Kaufman uh, et al. Uh, reconstruction. And Javier showed this because the red uncertainty bar uh, makes clear that even in their own terms, their claim is probably not uh, correct. So um, the, 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 it, it could have been warmer, even according to Kaufman, uh, during the Holocene uh, climate optimum uh, 6,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago. And in his chapter, Javier says, in conclusion, there is too much uncertainty in proxy reconstructions and instrumental temperature data sets to sustain with any degree of confidence that the present is warmer than the Holocene thermal maximum. Uh, and independent evidence from glacier and tree line changes supports the opposite assessment. And that's really interesting. So in the IPCC focuses a lot on um, um, uh, proxy reconstructions based on tree rings and corals and ocean sediments, etc. And they simply try to average them uh, using sometimes very fancy statistical methods. And Steve McIntyre, of course, has been paying attention to this for, for many, many, many years. But Javier showed other interesting, less difficult to understand um, 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 evidence, historical evidence, like, like the tree line 
I mean, we all know that if you go in the uh, walking in the Alps, uh, actually, I, I will go on Friday, I will go walking in the Italian Alps. And we all know that about 2000 meter, the, you, you will cross the, the tree line. But we know from evidence that the tree line in the past was much higher in the Alps, but also in Siberia or Canada or Norway, Scandinavia. So, um, and during talks nowadays, during public talks nowadays, I, I, I like to show this, this picture from Switzerland. It's the Susten Pass in Switzerland. And here you see a picture uh, taken about 20 years ago. And you see the glacier and you also see how the glacier withdrew since 8050. And of course, this is all climate change, it's all CO2, etc. But there is a Swiss a glacier um, um, uh, expert, a scientist, and he made a reconstruction of the same area 2000 years ago. And it, it looks like this. So it looks like this. The glacier was gone. And you see that the tree line was much higher. Here, you don't have to, any trees nowadays. But 2,000 uh, years ago, you had trees all over the place. So at least in this area, it was definitely warmer 2,000 years ago than it was nowadays. And of course, this is only a local, uh, a local signal. But um, for example, this medieval warm period project where he summarizes evidence from all around the world. And you see that all around the world, you see warming uh, uh, 1,000, 2,000 years ago. And this is from McIntyre, from Climate Audit. This is a glacier in Norway. And you see that before 4,000, uh, 5,000 years ago, there wasn't even a glacier. So during the optimum, uh, it was simply too warm for the glacier. And the glacier only uh, 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 came into being uh, later. And you see that it peaked during the Little Ice Age only very recently. And the and uh, so the, the retreat is, is, uh, is not that special, you could say. Here is another glacier from Norway where you see the same pattern. And this is also from McIntyre. This is the Renland Glacier in um, Greenland. And uh, McIntyre explains on his blog that this glacier is much more interesting than the GISP. Um, most of the people show GISP. A GISP is in the center of Greenland at high altitude. But um, the author of this graph is a uh, Winter, a guy named Winter, and he explains that the problem with the GISP is that you had a lot of altitudinal changes in the, in the center of Greenland, which has, of course, influence on the temperature. And this glacier didn't have those altitudinal changes because it's, on the, on the, it's near the coast. And this is the pattern you see. In my opinion, this is a much more... A realistic pattern of the Holocene. So you see a very quick warming uh, after the Ice Age, and it is peaking about 8,000, 9,000, 8,000 years ago. And then from 6,000 years ago, it already starts the next phase. It's called the neo glaciation. So we are already slowly entering the neo glacial, um, uh, glacial period. And with tree lines, you see the same. Here's just one example from the Swiss Alps. And you see that the tree line was definitely higher uh, thousands of years uh, ago. And this is the key graph from uh, the chapter by uh, Javier. It's a complicated graph, but he, his, his, um, um, his reconstruction is based on the Marcotte, Marcotte uh, reconstruction. It's based on proxy, uh, um, uh, proxies. Uh, it's, um, I will show it's, it's, it's this one. So this is the proxy reconstruction. So it's all, it's also, and, and this is obliquity. So this is the Milankovitch cycle. And so the point is that really, at, especially on the Northern hemisphere, the temperature and all the indicators are following Milankovitch. And, uh, here below, you see, uh, glacier advance. So if you see a, a, a bar, that means that there are, there is a region. Black is the Northern hemisphere. And blue is the southern hemisphere and red is the tropics. And so when you see a bar, it means that a, a certain glacial region is ex ex extending. And you see that most of the extension is, is taking place in the last couple of thousand years. And here there was not much uh, glaciation. So, um, 
So th this is the co conclusion by Javier, um, that it is more likely than not that the past decade is warmer than any century during the past 12,000 year is an untenable claim. So this is the first claim uh, of the IPCC that we uh, that we try to correct. They try to rewrite history and we try to correct uh, the record. So the hockey stick again, this is the only, now we focus on the last 2000 years. Uh, Steve McIntyre, I've been in touch with him a couple of times. Uh, he has been a bit bored about the whole uh, hockey team and all the all the stuff. Uh, I mean, especially after Climate Gate, he saw how he was criticized in all these emails. He lost his uh, his interest a little bit, but still, he has blocked um, about four articles about the new uh, hockey stick. And the problem is always the same. He is he is not. He we are we are not yet there, unfortunately, that we can fully reconstruct what they did. And one of the problems is that they don't give away the, the source code and, and exactly the data. And so we, it's not easy to really reproduce their result. But what he found out, and here you see in red, you see the IPCC hockey stick, the new IPCC hockey stick. And in, in um, black, you see a selection, a selection of proxies that is used, being used in the hockey stick, in the new hockey stick. And as you can see, Many proxies don't show anything. So they are just like adding noise to the reconstruction. And only a few of them have a strong hockey stick shape. And so it's always the few, few of those and the statistical method that produce the final hockey stick. How they did it exactly, we, we still don't know yet. But uh, hopefully McIntyre and other people will continue uh, and, and, and and let's hope I would like to make a, a separate project uh, within Clintel to 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 really reconstruct this one example from McIntyre's blog um, this is the proxy that was used by the IPCC on the top a strong hockey stick shape and when McIntyre used the same proxy data but the standard way of, of pro processing the data he he got the results below so something strange is going on with the, the processing of the data by the IPCC, but we, we, we are not yet, uh, we are not there yet. Well, anyway, this is what McIntyre so far concluded about a new hockey stick. If you thought Michael Mann's hockey stick was bad, imagine a woke hockey stick by woke climate scientists. As the climate scientists say, it's even worse than we thought. So we go on with the, uh, with the second trick. And that is uh, use shorter and shorter periods to claim a dramatic evolution. And the example we have there is from sea level rise. So what did they claim in the new report? They claimed an acceleration of the sea level rise. And how did they do that? They, uh, as you can see here, they changed, they, they compared different periods. And the periods they compared become uh, shorter and shorter. So they start with 1901, 2018, then 1901, 1971, then 1971, 2006, and then 2006, uh, 2018, which is a really short period, far too short to, to say something about trends in, in, in sea level rise because of this 18 year nodal uh, period that you also have to deal with. Um, and so this is the graph that they show. And here you see something other peculiar, and that is that you have this spaghetti graph. So they, 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 they show many, many, many uh, different um, uh, studies. And well, you tend to assume that this is just data that you're looking at. So this is tight gauges, for example. And then in the recent period, it's uh, maybe set uh, also combined with satellite data. But the problem is that here they also use uh, a budget, for example, they use budget data. So they try to, to come up with, uh, okay, the glaciers contribute so much and the warming of the oceans contribute so much. And that they, then they make also uh, an, a, a sea level uh, a time series by, by, by that. So that's not really data. That's, that's, a, um, yeah, that's totally different data than the time gauges. And, and what they didn't show is that here at the bottom, you see this, uh, this is a well-known paper by Fred, Fredericks, uh, Fredericks et al. Um, and what they didn't show, and um, I remember that uh, Steve Koonin showed it in, in his lecture for the ICSF, is that the Fredericks et al. paper also had this. And here you see, of course, on the left, you see the rate of change. 
So if you go up, it's it's uh, the sea level is rising faster, and if you go down, it's uh, it's rising slower. And here you see the decadal variation in the in the uh, sea level rise. And um, so um, this shows that it's far too early to conclude that there is really like an acceleration now of the uh, sea level rise, and that you it will probably take another 20, 20 30 years before you can before you have more certainty about that. Um, okay, Ole Humlem, um, our uh, Norwegian um, contributor, uh, had a chapter about this sea level tool. So the IPCC together with NASA, they uh, made a sea level projection tool available in which you can go to your favorite location and you can select one of the IPCC scenarios and then you can do a sea level scenario for your region and he did that in the, in his chapter he did that for a couple of um, uh, stations in scandinavia and i'm just going to show one for uh, oslo and here you see on the left you see the the trend the sea level trend in oslo it's going down because of the glacial uplifting the glacial rebound and then from 2020 you see in blue you see the uh, the projection of the IPCC sea level tool, and this is of course of course very funny. So they they expect a, a dramatic change in the trend uh, in starting in 2020, uh, the, the year that they start their projection uh, tool. And you will see this when you try to do this for your own uh, region. You will see also a jump in 2020. So for example, in Holland we have like a two two millimeters a year sea level rise. But uh, the projection tool um, uh, predicts uh, four millimeters uh, sin, uh, starting in 2020. So this is uh, quite funny, uh, I would say, that they that that they didn't even check this and that they tried to correct this for the for the reality. Okay, we go on with trick number three, and that is introduce new hybrid or blended data sets that immediately become the new golden standard. And this is from our chapter about snow um, cover. So Northern Hemisphere snow cover, we have good data. We have a lot of discussion about that. Uh, we know that in the spring, uh, there is a decline in snow cover, which you can expect if the spring is getting warmer. Uh, but we also know from a paper by Ronan Connolly um, that in uh, autumn and winter, there's actually uh, even a slight increase. So we were curious to see what IPCC did with uh, this information. Well, here is what they did. They came up with a brand new data set by a Canadian scientist named Mudrik. And um, this data set is actually um, a blended data set. So it's a mixture of seven different data sets. And Willis Eschenbach, uh, the blogger of uh, What's Up With That, um, he is a good data guy. And I asked Willis, could you have a look at this data? He tried to download the data from the IPC, but he failed. Only one of the data sets was available. The rest wasn't. And um, so Mudrik was a lead author or a contributing author. I, I forgot, but in it, uh, in, he was involved in the chapter. And so in the first draft of the report, he already introduced his new data set, while at the time his publication about his new data set was not even available. So it, it wasn't published, but it was already introduced. So expert reviewers, of course, cannot then check the material uh, because, well, it's not published yet. Officially, you can then ask the IPCC for the data, for the publication, etc. But how many of us will do that? Um, and so what, what they, so this is how they use the new data set. This is, so this is based on the Mudrik et al 2020 paper. And what they now did is based on this new blended data set, they now claim that, and you see that on the, on the left, that in every single month, month of the year, there is now a decreasing trend. So there is no increase anymore in autumn. There is no increase anymore in winter. And again, this is, this is not easy to, to check where this is coming from. The most well-known data set in, uh, about snow cover is the Rutgers Snow Data Lab. Uh, this graph is from Ole Humlem's uh, Climate for You uh, site. 
I, don't, I, I downloaded it uh, today, so it's the most recent version. And as you can see, if you look at the data since 1972, not much is going on. Maybe there is a very, very, very small decrease in the data, but it's really not much. And there is a lot of variability. And so it was also interesting to look at uh, the paper by Ron and Connolly. This is, these are two graphs, the, uh, two graphs from the paper by Ron and Connolly. And here you see uh, the autumn and the winter situation. So on the top, you see the data from the Rutgers Snow Lab and you see the, 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 the slight increase in this uh, in, the, in these seasons and below at the bottom you see what the climate models are predicting so the main conclusion of ronan uh, ronan's paper was um, climate models fail to uh, correctly simulate the trends in the autumn and in in the winter and so it was also interesting uh, whether the ipcc would mention Connolly and what they would say about it. Well, the good news is they mentioned uh, uh, Connolly at all, but this is what they said about the paper. The greatest declines in snow cover extent have occurred during boreal spring and summer, although the estimated magnitude is data set dependent. And then they mentioned Connolly at all. This is hilarious. And this is this this actually, you could call one, one, uh, one more trick by the IPCC, and that is, uh, of course, a lot of skeptical papers or papers by skeptical scientists are ignored by the IPCC, but sometimes the papers are mentioned, but mentioned in such a way as if it's the paper uh, confirms the IPCC conclusion, although the paper itself doesn't do that. And so this is, yeah, this is quite interesting to see how they, uh, how they deal with that. Okay, then a very uh, popular trick by the IPCC is hiding the good news. Well, Nick Lewis and I, uh, when we, um, okay, so when the, when the report came out, uh, either the working group one or the working group two report, uh, this is the media attention. So it was code red for humanity. Gutierrez was all over the place and the climate crisis in inevitable, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a lot of gloom and doom, doom and gloom. And so. When Nick Lewis and I wrote a report in 2014 about climate sensitivity, um, we called it a sensitive matter. And then we said how the IPCC buried evidence showing good news about global warming. Later, we heard that the climate scientists involved in the IPCC were really angry about this subtitle because it suggested some bad faith by, by the IPCC. And we were a bit surprised about that because, come on, uh, guys, uh, you, you claim all kinds of things. And when you get criticized, you, you cannot uh, handle it. So, um, but anyway, um, there is again in AR6, there is a lot of good news. And what they still, what they do again is they try to hide it. They often they hide it by burying it deeply in the report. So you can find it on page 1687 or so, you know. And so they hide it in the summary for policymakers. And sometimes it's just, it, it's simply ignored or it's just, uh, it's, it, it, they come up with the opposite claim. And we will show some examples. So I go into climate sensitivity very shortly uh, because this is a topic which in itself, I would say, um, um, uh, yeah, would deserve a, a, a full lecture um, of 45 minutes. Um, as you know, since Charney, the, um, the, the range, the likely range for climate sensitivity was always 1.5 to 4.5. And in AR6, or no, first in AR5, um, it was still 1.5, 4.5 after it was 2 to 4.5 in AR4. And Lewis and I explain why they had to decrease lower the lower bound to 1.5 again. This had to do with papers by Nick Lewis and other people uh, based on uh, observations since 8050. They, they point towards a lower climate sensitivity. And so we wondered, of course, Nick Lewis and I and other people, Judith Curry, uh, we wondered what would the IPC do in AR6? And they came up with a spectacular result because they raised it to 2.5 to 4. So this means that the IPCC now claims that climate sensitivity is much more uh, likely to be inside this narrow range from 2.5 2 to 4. And their best estimate is still 3 degrees Celsius. 
However, there is a paper by Nick Lewis and Judith Curry, and their approach is simply accepting everything from the IPCC. So they accept all the forcings, all the temperature increase, etc. And they accept that all the warming actually is due to the greenhouse gases. So it's a very conservative um, uh, assumption that they use. And when they use this energy budget method, so uh, such a, as it is called, then they still come up with an estimate for climate sensitivity that is in the 1.5 to 2 region, so not above 2.5. The new IPCC range was based on one paper by Sherwood et al. in 2020. And this paper, this is an example of a paper that is more or less ordered by the community, by which is mean, uh, I mean that almost everybody who, who, who publishes about climate sensitivity, sensitivity was involved in this Sherwood et al. review paper. It was a paper, 100 pages. And so this paper also became the new golden standard immediately. And the new range in IAR6 was based on this paper. Well, Nick Lewis then published a paper after the deadline of the IPCC. So after the publication, actually, of the IPCC. And he redid what Sherwood et al. did. And when he did that, his estimate, based on the same method as Sherwood et al. used, but based on updated data and some improvements in the statistics, his best estimate came down from 3.16 in the IPCC to 2. Point, uh, low in the in the, the two point uh, 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 slightly above two. And his conclusion is that climate sensitivity is more likely to be below two than above 2.5. So in this case, it was after the publication of the AR6 report that, uh, the, 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 that there was really like already a correction in the literature that this, uh, this estimate by the IPCC was wrong. Um, so this is what we conclude in, 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 in our report that this rise of the lower bound to 2.5 is not justified. And we uh, suggest that observed warming and other evidence indicates that the true figure is more likely to be below two than above 2.5. So Ross McKittrick wrote a chapter uh, about the tropical hotspot. Um, and of course, the tropical hotspot, many of you are familiar with that. That is the one of the most significant, significant warming patterns. Uh, the high in the tropics, you, you should see uh, amplified uh, warming. And here he shows that both globally and in the tropics, uh, the models overestimate the observed warming. So in blue, you see the observations. And in red, you see all the models, all the individual models. And the, the, the most, the red bar on the right is the average of all the models. And in their paper by uh, 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 McKittrick and Christie, uh, published in 2020, they show this, uh, this plot. And so they show that there is a statistical a significant difference between the models and the observations, both globally in the troposphere and uh, high in the tropics. And what is interesting is that uh, McKittrick and Christie made this uh, a graph where you see uh, all these model as uh, all these uh, model um, values, the the, the observed. Uh, and so the the model the 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 warming in the models in the troposphere and in the tropics, and then in the green circle you see what it should mean, what the op, what what the values you see the. I uh, I have to point this. These are the obs uh, these are the observations, the real observations. So this is for the lower troposphere, and this is for the mid troposphere, and you see that this this is the implied climate sensitivity. So his work for the tropics and for the global troposphere also indicates a climate sensitivity between one and two degrees Celsius. And the paper by McKittrick and uh, Christie is also mentioned, is mentioned in, um, in AR6. And they also uh, say that uh, they, uh, they, they, they conclude that it has to do something with climate sensitivity, but AR6 themselves, of course, don't Finally, they don't draw this uh, conclusion. So we go on with the extremes because that's really important. Of course, uh, uh, we hear every day about climate change will uh, lead to a, a more extreme weather. And this um, 
table you probably recognize from um, 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 a blog or a, a talk by Roger Pukey Jr. It's uh, it's it was drafted by uh, by Roger Pukey Jr. It was actually his summary of the AR6 report. So if you take AR6 at face value, accept everything they claim, this is what they claim about extremes. And uh, to 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 uh, to have the good news, you see that flooding. Flooding, meteorological drought, hydrological drought, because they now they have now four categories for drought. Tropical cyclones, winter storms, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hail, lightning, extreme winds. All these things are claimed by the IPCC themselves. There is no detected trend, and so there is no attribution. You you, you cannot uh, attribute it to to CO two. And this, of course, is very good news. Why is it good news? Because flooding and Cyclones and storms are co are causing by far most of the damage. About ninety percent of the global damage because of uh, due to extreme weather is caused by flooding and by uh, hurricanes uh, by by tropical cyclones. So the fact that these don't show a trend is really really good news, and you would expect that news in the summary for policymaker. And what we show in our report is that they. Don't mention this in a summary for policymakers at all. Actually, they made a, a significant error in the uh, about um, uh, tropical cyclones. Well, here you see, uh, you probably have seen this before. This is for the US, where you see a slight downward trend for uh, landfalling uh, hurricanes. And this is also funny. This graph is has been published in a peer-reviewed publication. And we have now... In total, there are now 47 IPCC reports since 1990. There have been 47 IPCC reports. And a graph like this has never been shown in any of the IPCC reports. And um, so here is uh, one of the conclusions of the IPCC about uh, tropical cyclones. They claim now that there is a change in tropical cyclone. So TC is tropical cyclone characteristics. They say it's likely that the global proportion of category three to five tropical cyclones um, uh, instances, uh, so that there is an increase in, in, in heavy, in, uh, in heavy um, uh, uh, tropical cyclones. And here, here we show data by Ryan Mao. And well, you could say, Okay, the upper the upper part is all hurricanes. The lower is major hurricanes. Both don't show a real trend. But you could make the point that maybe the all hurricanes are going down a little bit faster than uh, the major hurricanes. So indeed, it could mean uh, it could be that the the proportion changes. But uh, in the past couple of weeks, Roger Puke has wrote has written uh, several blog posts about this specific claim by the IPCC. And he has shown that they made a, a real error based on a pa paper by Cosin et al. And they confused measurements of uh, tropical cyclones by the tropical cyclones themselves. And this led to, uh, in steps, this, le this led to a, a confusion in different drafts of the IPCC report. And ultimately, the, 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 the error they made was not corrected. And it, it, it made it to the summary for policymakers. And this error now was admitted to him by one of the IPCC people. So I really, I'm really, yeah, I'm really eager to see how they how they are going to deal with this in the future. If if they're going to correct this uh, error by themselves, uh, this graph, of course, you also uh, know uh, it was published by Björn Lomborg, but you see it a lot on LinkedIn or Twitter, in social media, Facebook. Uh, but what people maybe are not aware is that Björn Lomborg published this uh, graph in a peer-reviewed publication in 2020. So we looked if AR6, the Working Group 2 report, if they mentioned this paper. No, they didn't. And did they mention the data set? Because the data set is the M dot uh, data set. And yes, they mentioned the data set. But instead of showing this graph, they showed it in this way. So what they did is they took the period 2010, 2020, and without giving numbers, they give only the difference. So they show that in Asia and Africa, more people are dying from uh, extreme weather than in North America or in Austra uh, Australia, etc. 
but they didn't show um, um, a very positive graph like this uh, showing a huge decline in uh, in, in mortality. Um, so, um, oh yeah, we have more good news. Who control the past controls the future. That's from uh, George Orwell as well. And I mentioned this because all uh, when we deal with the future, of course, the IPCC uses scenarios. And um, this is one example of the scenarios. And uh, this is for sea level change. Um, and of course, you see the highest scenarios is SSP um, 8.5 and 7.0. And these scenarios can be quite dramatic. And as you probably are aware, uh, in the last few years, uh, people like Roger Pilkey and Burgess and, 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 and a couple of uh, uh, scientists, they have published a lot of papers about that these, especially the 8.5 and 7.0 scenarios are not um, realistic. They are totally implausible. And of course, it was interesting to see what the IPCC did with these newspapers. Well, most of them uh, were ignored by the IPCC. And But what they did is interesting. This is from Roger Buki. Um, um, so they did two things. Um, on the one hand, they said that, okay, in general, no likelihood is attached to the scenarios. So if a policymaker asks the IPCC, what is the likelihood of the different scenario? Which one is most likely? Then the IPCC will say, oh, we don't know. We cannot say, we, we, don't, we, ha we don't have any judgment about that. Um, but then at the same time, uh, deeply buried in the, in the report, they say that um, the likelihood of a high emission scenario such as RCP 8.5 and uh, SSP 5 8.5 is considered low in light of recent developments in the energy sector. And that's really interesting. So they now admit in AR6 that the um, 8.5 scenario is uh, uh, has a low likelihood, but they didn't mention this in the summary for policymakers. So I have no idea how a policymaker should be aware of this. The media is not bringing this news um, actually, in the Netherlands, at this moment, they are preparing the next scenarios for, for Holland, the Dutch, the KNMI scenarios. And I heard from people in the, in the Netherlands that they are still using this a, uh, RCP 8.5 scenario. It's For me, it's totally incredible, but they're still uh, using it. So uh, also in the Netherlands, people will be not aware of this. At the same time, this is also from Pukki, um, uh, SSP, SSP 5, 8.5 and RCP 8.5 were, were mentioned most of the times. Yeah. In 40, if they use, if they mention a scenario in 41.5% of the times, it was, uh, it, it was a mention of, uh, the RCP 8.5. So the, the whole report is, is, is full with, with reference to, uh, RCP 8.5, although we now know that this scenario is totally implausible. It's not going to happen. How can you understand that this is not going to happen? I skipped that one. Well, here is an example of the coal use in 2100. At the moment in 2020, we use 151 exajoules, um, from six south, 6,600 power plants, coal power plants. If you go to um, the, uh, the 8.5 scenario in 2100, we need to buy, we need to build one new coal power plant every day until 2100. So an additional um, 32,000 um, 32, additional power plants. And if you go to the 7.0 scenario, it's still 17,000 additional power plants. So both these scenarios are completely implausible. And um, yeah, here you see a paper by Burgess et al., um, a, a co-author of Pukey. And in their latest paper, they say that the most, um, because below 7.0, you have the RCP 6.0, RCP 4.5. That's so far that that's a middle of the road scenario. But they, in their latest paper, they even say that, that the current path that we are on is even below that. It's even below 4.5. They say the most likely scenario is now um, 3.4. And 3.4, the 3.4 scenario is mentioned 
zero times in AR6. It's not mentioned at all. And according to Pukey and Burgess, that could be at the moment the most likely uh, scenario for the future. For the future. Okay, um, I go on quickly because uh, I'm probably running out of time. Um, trick number five, that is the good old cherry picking. And this, this is the most, this is from chapter 12 in our report. And this is the most devastating error, a uh, striking example that we have found uh, in, in the report. So um, if you watched the Pukey talk uh, one year ago, uh, also at the ICSF, then you might remember that he was talking about this. What was going on? Pukey, Pukey Jr. is an expert in what they call normalized disaster losses. So we all understand that if you had a hurricane in 1900 in Miami, in Florida, then there was less damage than if you have a hurricane today. Because nowadays you have more people, you have more houses, you have more capital. So if you want to compare two hurricanes, uh, you have to make a normalization of the data. And Pukey Jr. published a paper in 1998 with a, met, uh, uh, with a method how you could normalize the data. And since then, um, about um, 50, more than 50 papers have been published in literature. And Pukey, in 2020, he thought, okay, it would be interesting to write a review paper about all the papers that have been published because the, the IPCC AR6 report is coming up. And so I can do already the work for the IPCC. So he published this paper. And in his paper, he showed this table. And this table shows all the, all the studies that were published. In total, it were 53 publications dealing with um, uh, disaster losses due to extreme weather. Could be hurricanes, could be floods, could be fire, uh, 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 forest fire, etc. And of those 53 pa uh, papers, only one, and it's, uh, it's in yellow here, the Grinstead et al. paper claimed an increase in damage, and also it claimed that it, was, it could be attributed to CO2. And so uh, what happened in the AR6 report, in the Working Group 2 report, is that the IPCC more or less ignored all 52 studies in this table, and they highlighted the Grinstead et al. paper, then claiming an increase in disaster losses. And this is such a, yeah, this is such an incredible form of cherry picking that even if you are a big fan uh, of the IPCC, you have to admit that this, this is not how it should go. This is from another peer-reviewed paper by Pukey. This is showing with the same method uh, what we know about the global situation. And um, as you can see, there is even a slight decrease in uh, in the disaster losses globally. Yeah, if you correct for global GDP. Yeah, so global GDP in this period uh, increased significantly. So the damage also increases, but if you normalize the data, there is no increase. And so it's unlikely that climate change has anything to do with that uh, at the moment. And he is an expert on extremes. He is an expert on disaster losses. He is an expert on scenarios. So a lot of his work is highly relevant for the IPCC. Um, and of course, I, I asked him personally, uh, were you ever invited by the IPCC? Um, 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 they really treat him like Voldemort from the Harry Potter uh, films. And when I asked him about this, he said, well, actually, Indeed, um, and Andrew Rafkin, the former New York Times uh, correspondent, also made this comparison with uh, with Voldemort. And uh, this is a quote from Pukey, and um, uh, I, I highlight it in the the, the the bottom. Roger Pukey will never participate in the IPCC. That was that was said by an IPCC official from from the from the from the US. And so, yeah, in, in my opinion, this is really the big, big problem in the IPCC. Uh, it is a biased uh, approach because it's, uh, it's a matter of groupthink. They only invite people who already support uh, the whole 
the whole paradigm uh, that uh, it's a climate change, it's unprecedented, it has, uh, it's caused by CO2 and it's, it's, it's horrible, it's terrible. If you agree all those things, then you are willing to participate in the IPCC. If like Pilke, Pilke is not even a climate skeptic. He, he accepts that CO2 is causing climate change. He wrote a book about climate policy. He's in favor of decarbonization. But still, he is not in favor of exaggerating the science. He will, he wants to be, he wants integrity of the science. And that's not even welcome in the, uh, in the IPCC. So to conclude, um, what, what's next? Because the report is out. Uh, so far, the media in the Netherlands and abroad uh, are more or less ignoring it. We, it's not unexpected. Uh, people like Roger Buki, Judith Curry, the Daily Skeptic in the UK, they paid attention to it. So we will, we will go slowly. But what we did in the report is that we, 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 we related our work to this Inter-Academy Council uh, report. Some of you, maybe if you're new to the discussion, you don't know about the Inter-Academy Council. Well, back in 2010, we had uh, also, we had some um, uh, affair. It, we had Climate Gate after Climate Gate. We had, um, some errors discovered in the uh, in the IPCC report, and then the Inter Academy Council was asked to investigate the IPCC process, and they did a lot of recommendations. They were actually quite critical, and so now we are planning to send a letter to the IPCC, and in this letter we refer to the Inter Academy Council, and I will give you an example of the things that we write uh, that the IPCC commissioned a team. Uh, with representation from Clintel and other independent persons not involved in the IPCC leadership to review whether the IPCC has fully implemented and followed the reforms recommended by the 2020 I IAC review and whether more reforms are needed. And some other things that we, uh, we request that the IPCC review prominent statements by major world leaders, think about Gutierrez, and media outlets paraphrasing the contents of the era six and correct the record where those statements are misleading or inaccurate. Think about extremes. The climate's getting more extreme. No, many of the extremes are not increasing according to AR6 themselves. And the final one is that the IPCC meet with representatives from Clintel to receive input on the key deficiency highlighted in our report that require a formal correction. And so again, the, the book uh, will be soon available, uh, I think next week uh, as an ebook or a paperback. So you can go to Amazon or other um, uh, suppliers and you can order. Of course, the PDF will be freely available on our website, but you can also um, go to um, buy a paperback or ebook uh, version. Well, that was it for now. Thank you very much.